And good Wednesday evening. How's it going, everybody? Tom Young here with the uh, Tom Talks Baseball podcast, doing another live interactive podcast with you guys this evening. Uh, glad, as always, you can join us. A hot one here in the Texas Panhandle. I think my phone said 104 today in Amarillo. Uh, not a great day to be outside very long. So hopefully you're inside, you're at home, you're staying cool in the A.C., and uh, can chat with us a little bit about baseball tonight. As always, uh, my partner in crime here on the podcast, David Lovejoy, uh, joining us this evening. David, how you doing, sir? And we're having an issue with David's connection. We'll see if we can get him uh, uh, back with us here. I'm as doing he great. How you doing today, oh, Tom? There we go. Uh, the video and the audio a little bit laggy there and uh, popping in. But, uh, but David with us yeah. there, live from, yeah. from his place. I'm live from mine, right. and you're live with us here on uh, Facebook, Tom Talks Baseball Podcast Facebook page. Also, our YouTube page, uh, which you can check us out there, uh, just Tom Talks Baseball Podcast, and also the Eagle Facebook page, KXGL-FM. Look for that there. Fun show tonight. We're going to do a little Major League Baseball first, David. A few things that we can touch on quickly. Got a couple of guests lined up. If all goes according to plan, in about 10 minutes or so, Suzanne Talley, uh, executive director with the Kauff Memorial Blood Center, is going to join us to talk about this Saturday, because you and I, David, got a lot of fun coming up uh, at Hodgetown with the uh, Boots versus Badges charity softball game. We're going to be on the PA for some reason. I don't know what they were thinking about that, but uh, you got those chops ready to go? You, you good? We're ready to go. I uh, matter of fact, I talked to Jason Love. Uh, a firefighter who's played this uh, 17 year firefighter uh, has played this game several times last year. He said that was his last one. And he is, he's going to be on the bench uh, this time, managing uh, doing more of that role than playing baseball, but they're excited and they're ready to go after uh, the APD, the Emerald police department. Funny thing. I said, give me a prediction. Guess what he said? What'd he say? Firefighters double them up. Oh, double them oh, up. Cool. Ouch. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess, yeah, I guess we will see about that. Uh, we'll, we'll find out game time seven, seven Oh five on Saturday. We're going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. And then about five 30 tonight, Tony Enzer, uh, president and GM of the Emerald Saab Poodle is going to join us. The Texas collegiate league wrapped up on Saturday. Unfortunately, no Amarillo champion this time around, but uh, they finished a season, David, uh, something that, uh, we're kind of wondering if we're going to do on the major league side of things, but they finished a little 30 game season, had a lot of fun at Hodgetown. I'm going to talk a little bit about that with Tony Enzer. Uh, Aturo checking us out tonight. Wants to know how it's going. Going very well. Thanks for checking us out, Aturo. Uh, a, a prominent player as well in the uh, Tom Talks Baseball podcast, a fantasy baseball league, which I got some work to do, by the way. Uh, but I had a good week last week. I am uh, I'm uh, making a comeback. But Major League Baseball, of course, David, uh, there was some big news that came out uh, yesterday based on something that happened on Sunday. And, of course, that was the big brawl in Oakland between uh, the Astros and the A's. Uh, uh, Ramon Laureano getting bean for a third time in the series took exception to it, but seemed to be, you know, while he was like telling the pitcher how to throw his curveball, which was kind of funny. Uh, Alex Centrone, hitting coach of the Astros, was egging him on in the dugout. It led to a brawl, which is a big no-no in uh, COVID-19 times. And uh, so suspensions came down. The Astros hitting coach got 20 games, and uh, Liriano got six. I just want to know your thoughts. We saw Joe Kelly get eight uh, for a couple of uh, head-hunting pitches, you know, whether it was intentional or not. Uh, yeah. Thoughts on this suspension? Do you think it was a good one? Do you think it was a little harsh? What do you think? Uh, you know, that's the longest uh, suspension, the, the heftiest suspension ever put on a major league baseball coach uh, who didn't get the the death penalty or, the, you know, the Pete Rose where you can't come back at all, uh, just a suspension uh, for taunting, basically. Uh, I, you know, this, this would not be going on if Major League Baseball would have did the right thing and not give those players blanket immunity uh, for their scandal, for their cheating. And some of those guys had to sit out a season or something like that. And, and so, you know, it's almost like, well, hey, this is what you're going to get all season. You knew this was coming. You just better be glad it's 60 games and not 160 uh, because they would be getting bounced all across the place. Uh, I, I, You know, the, the, the managers, the, the coaches chirping at the guy, and then he runs over there and gives himself up like a puppy. You know, he wasn't he, he wasn't running over there to fight anybody. 
If you were going to run to their dugout and fight, you would have slid down to the ground. You you just put on a show. But, I, you know, it's just tough because if MLB would have did the right thing and suspended these players for so, some hefty time instead of giving them immunity, you probably wouldn't see this retaliation the way you keep seeing it. Uh, p- p- perhaps not. And, and I can understand why uh, Loriano was upset. I mean, getting being three times. Now, the last one was an off-speed pitch, so a pitch that just kind of slipped. And so I think he realized that it wasn't intentional, but I think he was getting fed up because, you know, three times in one series, that's enough. You know, quit, quit being to me. I'm tired of it. And then you got the hitting coach who has absolutely nothing to do with anything in this situation, egging him on, clearly. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the suspension was good. And, and some people thinking that Loriano was going to get more than Kelly because this season they are anti-brawl. You know, yeah, with, with yeah. the COVID-19, with the social distancing. But when you think about it, six games for a position player probably going to hurt more than eight games for a relief pitcher right. who you aren't going to use in all eight of those games. Yeah. So I, I think Loriano's penalty was was a stiffer overall uh, than it was compared to uh, Kelly's. But in the yeah, end, yeah. Major League Baseball doesn't want you to do this. You know, they don't want you to brawl. They don't want you to charge other teams, get in fights, get all close like that. And if you're going to do it, the penalty is going to be harsh. And I agree with you. Penalty should have been harsher way before any of this happened. You know, yeah. you know back when they laid down the law on the Astros or, or didn't, as most people would think. But uh, I think this was this was a fine punishment. I, I, I'm on the fence when you say Major League Baseball doesn't want this. Uh, you can say the same thing. Hockey doesn't want this fighting. Well, if you don't want it, outlaw it. And make it a serious incident. Uh, you you take the bean ball and brushing people back out of the game. If you start head hunting, you're gone. You're gone for 15 games. You're gone for 20 games, just like PED usage. If you want it out of the game, you can. In hockey, overseas in European Russian league, they don't do that fighting stuff. They don't have the maulers. They don't have the henchmen on the ice, and they just play hockey. It's a faster game, more exciting. Right now is the best time to watch hockey, playoff hockey, because you don't have goons out there taking up time just to lay heavy on someone. And if you want to get rid of it, you can't. But you can't just kind of wink and and not say anything when somebody does a backflip and the next time he comes up and he gets popped or the next batter gets popped. That's got to stop. You know, you got you got to say no. It's the difference between NASCAR and Formula One. NASCAR, oh, they're great with swapping paint and pushing each other around. Formula One racing, no, 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 don't do that. And so what do you want? If baseball really wanted to get rid of the fighting, they can, but they don't. It's part of the attraction. And, uh, and and we'll see what happens going forward. Uh, you know, if any more brawls happen, uh, will Major League Baseball have an even stiffer penalty? Will it maybe be eight games for a position player as opposed to six like this one was? Uh, some other things we would like to talk about a little bit later on with Major League Baseball. I want to talk about Charlie Blackman, who was hitting 500 before yeah. the day started. Wow. Over, over three today, but a very interesting thing happened with that that I do want to talk about before we're off of here today. But, David, I think we have a guest. I think we have our first guest of the day, and uh, and I think we're going to go ahead and bring her in, Suzanne Talley with the Coffee Memorial Blood Center. How you doing, Suzanne? We are doing so great. We just left the Sod Poodle Stadium. We did our final walkthrough for the game, and we are excited about this Saturday yeah. night. Yes, and, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about, the uh, the 13th annual uh, Boots versus Badges charity softball game happening this Saturday night. Uh, gates open up at 6.05, game time 7.05. Uh, Suzanne, any, anyone who has not attended this game before, uh, tell us what you can expect as a fan going to Hodgetown on Saturday. Well, it's going to be amazing. So the Boots are playing the Badges, so firefighters are playing law enforcement. Gates open at 6.05, game starts at 7.05. Uh, we're going to fly in uh, a blood recipient family, Emily Emery Williams, young lady who was diagnosed with cancer at seven weeks old, and she is now 10 years old, thanks to some expert medical care and blood donors. She'll be throwing out our first pitch, but Lifestar will make an incredible two-helicopter delivery of that young lady to the game. 
That's and awesome. The part of the game <laughs> is the helicopters yeah. coming into the stadium. <laughs> uh, then we're going to have, um, we will be having a 10 inning softball game. And okay. last year, I think we had about nine balls hit out of the park. So we keep it pretty fun and exciting. Of course, we'll have the color guard there, the honor guard. And um, we'll have the uh, national anthem will be a little different this year. It will be performed on an electric guitar. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then as a special treat, uh, Van Chris Christensen will be singing God Bless America cool. later in the game. And he will be doing that a cappella with two of his brothers that are in town. Mm. So that'll be kind of a fun treat. And of course, Allie Allison is our on-field talent. And we'll be having a lot of fun between inning events. And uh, it's just a great night of family fun. And w what else can you do for $5 to $8 <laughs> in this town? Yeah, exactly. Five to eight dollars. It's a great price. Things uh, being done a little differently this year, including uh, yes. ways, ways to get some tickets. Let's talk about that. I know you, you had an event at the Blood Center, 7500 Wallace Boulevard today, but uh, there's another day you can go by and get some tickets, right? And if so, what kind of packages are you selling? Yes. Yeah, so because of social distancing, they have Hodgetown has done the tickets a little bit different. We're seating in the lower areas and it's every other row or <laughs> vertically. And then horizontally, it's four tickets, skip two seats, four tickets, skip two seats. We are sold out of twos and sixes. Okay. So we are selling them in groups of four. So um, bring your friends or Buy two seats as a donation, I guess is the best way to say that. Um, we will be, you know, of course, have our hand sanitizer. You will have to wear your mask while seated. I mean, while out of your seat, but not while seated. Okay. And uh, tell us a little bit more about this event. It's a big charity softball game. Of course, it's a lot of fun. And like you said, uh, I know I was caught off guard last year when you talked about the nine home runs. I wasn't expecting that at all. And then you got yeah. these guys up here like, I think there was one that actually went over bar 352. <laughs> I oh, was yeah. just like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> I think that would be uh, Mr. Brad Hansen on yeah. the fire department team. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd be intentionally walking that guy. That guy is, is pure power for sure. Uh, well, I will tell you after seven, they did start yeah. walking. <laughs> they did. I, I think the game's not until Saturday, and he's already got two hits, I think. Yeah, already. He <laughs> yeah, he's already got two hits. Uh, that is so true. <laughs> but but yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it's a fun night, of course. You can bring the whole family out there. Mm -hmm. There'll be concessions and all the, all the great stuff on top of the softball game, like you said, yes. Suzanne. But it's also a big charity event. Tell us about what uh what everything is going towards what all what are all the proceeds going towards on saturday so, coffee memorial being a nonprofit organization this is one of the the fundraisers that we have throughout the year it didn't start as a fundraiser that just became a bonus for us as a thank you um to our firefighters and law enforcement we do split the proceeds uh, 50 50 with the 100 club of the texas panhandle who stands behind our men and women behind the badge and what they do the 100 club does is anytime a firefighter or a law enforcement officer is killed or injured in the line of duty they meet the immediate needs of the family by delivering a check within 24 hours that, that's awesome. And so uh, David and I are going to be out there as well. Uh, last year, we had the uh, opportunity of being, uh, you know, the PA announcers and uh, you've invited us back. So I got to work on some quick an and exceptional job. Well, well thank you. I, I got to work on some quick and witty lines. And I'm sure David's got a few already lined up. Maybe. But, uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you before y'all are announcing. So this is our 13th year for the blood drive competition. It's our 12th year for the game. For the okay. Game. Yeah. And, and speaking of the blood drive competition, Suzanne, of course, COVID-19 has had a big effect on, on a number of things uh, across this country. Yes. And I know uh, the blood center has been hit kind of hard by it as well. How, how are donations right now? Uh, are they starting to pick back up or are people still a little iffy about going there because of all that's happening? Well, this is one of the cleanest, safest places you can come. And so is the donation process. However, we did kind of get a little bit of a hit today. A lot of our schools, which we completely understand, 
But our school's elementary uh, has a kids care program where they can invite their parent to donate and they get a prize. We also have our high school programs and with ki- with schools not even letting the parents in uh, to the schools this year, it's, it's not looking good for our blood drives. And so um, that's about a third, like I said, of the fall blood supply. So we need people to step up and host blood, blood drives. And if you've got, you know, if you think you can present 22 to 25 donors and let us net about 15 units, it's worth the trip out. Awesome. And if anybody wants to do that or just individually they want to come on by and donate, where can they go? What do they have to do? If you're interested in hosting a blood drive, you can call Dakota Newsom at 806 831-8855 331-8855 and she can direct you to the donor recruiter who handles that account uh, and then you asked me about tickets for the game and I neglected to answer oh. that so let me back <laughs> up a little bit okay we'll backtrack a touch about that. okay so tickets to the game we're selling here at coffee 7500 Wallace uh, it is your last chance to get advanced tickets we'll be here from six to eight tomorrow night uh, and we will stay open late uh, just to sell tickets. So we'll be here, stop on by, and then we will have what tickets we have left. We've got plenty of lawns, standing room only, and the patio areas, which will be available at the game on game night. Okay. And then if anyone individually wants to come on by at any point, Suzanne, to donate, uh, sign up, like how are we able to do that right now? Well, you can go to our our website, thegiftoflife.org. You can call us at 806-331-8833, or you can visit our Facebook page, and we're always posting fun stuff on there. All right. Well, go ahead, Dave. You got anything? Well, well Miss Talley, I want to want you to make the point of uh, a lot of people don't know exactly. They think it's maybe for accidents or natural disasters, but how many different things do blood and blood products go into in our healthcare fields out there and help save lives. Thank you, David, for asking that. That is excellent. So coffee has to draw about 100 to 125 units per day to meet the needs of the Texas and Oklahoma Panhandle, which is 31 counties and 29 medical facilities. And so what's happened is no COVID patients are receiving blood. We get that question all the time. Why do you need it if they're not receiving blood? But cancer patients are. Accidents are still happening. Cancer treatment is still happening. Premature babies are still born. Appendix are still rupturing. Uh, Moms are still in distress after delivery. And so the need for blood doesn't stop. And, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, it's just it's an important thing and 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 to be a hero to save a life and i always joke about uh real heroes don't run around in their underwear at capes they drive <laughs> red trucks or black and white cars or they work at coffee memorial because those people save lives every day in our they community. do they really do and i couldn't be more proud of my team that's been on the front lines uh, with with our healthcare workers and our first responders since the get go we uh, there's no working from home here <laughs> and, and, and one more thing about the uh, the blood center, Suzanne. You, you guys do plasma too, yeah. right? We do. We okay. Do. And the new thing is uh, convalescent plasma. And what that is, is it is plasma that is taken as a donation from someone who has had a positive diagnosis for COVID-19 or a positive antibody test. And they have been 14 days or more symptom free. They can go on register online at BioLinked, which is B-I-O hyphen L-I-N-K-E-D dot org. It's posted to the top of our Facebook page if you just want to click on it. And if you meet those criteria, you can register to donate convalescent plasma. The antibodies that you built in your system when you battled and overcame the coronavirus are still present and they can be very healing to a person in their bloodstream that's currently battling the virus. Well, Suzanne, thank you very much for joining us tonight, uh, learning a lot about the Blood Center, uh, always uh, helping out the community. Uh, Go donate, and and I've done it a few times there. It it doesn't take very long. It it doesn't take much time of your day, you know, and and the whole thing that maybe you're worried about is about 15 minutes. Like, and 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 you're you're in and out. It doesn't take very long. But uh, one final Mm -hmm. time, if anyone wants to donate, uh, how can they go about doing that? Okay, if you want to donate, call us at 806-331-8833. If you want to host a blood 
drive called Dakota at 806-331-8855. If you want to register to donate convalescent plasma, go to our Facebook page, Coffee Memorial Blood Center, click on the link for convalescent plasma, and it'll take you right to buy a link to register. Very good, Suzanne. We'll Thank you very you much. we'll see you guys Saturday night. Yes, I was going to say one final time, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the softball game, Saturday, gates open 6.05, game time 7.05, and uh, tickets, uh, what time tomorrow at the Blood Center? Six advanced to eight. Tickets? Six to eight. So stop uh -huh. on by 7,500 Wallace. Get those advanced tickets. Just a four, yes, a packs of four, like you said, right? Packs of four or lawn and standing room only. There you go. But we've got some great seats still left, so don't hesitate to come. So, Suzanne, thank you very much for joining us this evening on the uh, Tom Talks Baseball podcast. And uh, we will see you out there on Saturday. Thanks. Anyway. Sounds good. <laughs> So there we go, Suzanne Talley with uh, the uh, Cough Memorial Blood Center. Uh, thanks for her joining us tonight on the podcast. And uh, like I said, we're going to be out there, David. We did it last year. Pretty good turnout. The, the, the setting of Hodge Town is great for this it event. Uh, and, it, and it both, because I've seen the Boots and Badges played out at the old Potter County Memorial, and I've seen it here. And, uh, man, I just I thought, oh, yeah, you're going to get some deep flies, and, you know, they're going to be, you know, gutting out runs on airs and stuff. And then the gun show happened. And the guy started just blasting, and and Tom and I were like, "What's going on here?" Like, I know, like it, it was it was crazy. It wasn't fluke, barely getting over fences either. No. I mean, that, that one guy, I know he hit it over the bar. I, I mean, they, and it was just him. I mean, that's that's a four hundred foot shot. Oh my gosh, at man. least at ah. least a four hundred foot shot. And then like he, he, he had, was, that guy had like two grand yeah. slams. <laughs> Didn't he have like two grand slams and you know like I, two other? Like I, I said, think there were a couple. Yeah, he's already got three, and it's not even Saturday. He's got three hits already. It's not even Saturday because that oh. guy is a hit machine. So you know what that means? The APD is gonna come back with a chip on their shoulder. That, that they're they're gonna come back. That, that they're strategizing. That, you know that they're trying to figure that lineup out and everything. And then yeah. they're gonna be out there mashing as well. And it's gonna be fun for everybody. And uh, and hopefully we and what five to eight bucks? I think she said. So yeah. I mean, yeah. great you know affordable family really entertainment. Do? I'm What's gonna that? reach out to Miss Suzanne, and I'm gonna see if I can get four tickets, and let's give them away. Okay. You gonna do that? You gonna do that right now? I wanna do that right now. Four okay. Tickets. Okay. Okay. I'll well, 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 tickets. I'll see if you. I'll see if you can. You can get that locked it down. Okay. And uh, and in the meantime, we do have another guest lined up. We're, we're gonna hopefully have him on in a little bit. Tony Enzer, uh, President and GM of the Amarillo Sound Poodles. We're gonna talk about some. Uh, TCL while David live on the air is is yeah. trying to uh, do some stuff also behind the scenes. But let's go back to some Major League Baseball talk for a moment. And once again, whether it's a Major League Baseball talk or the interviews, uh, this is a live interactive podcast. You have the ability to chime in. If you uh, let's say you're watching that Suzanne Talley interview, but you had a question, you can ask it here. That's the beauty of this thing. You can ask that question, and then we will maybe, depending on what it is, we'll get it out there, and Suzanne can answer it for you right there. So be thinking right now. If you have any questions for Tony Enzer about maybe the sod poodles, about the sod dogs and sod squad and the TCL, about how all that went down, don't be afraid to ask because we may uh, use your question to ask Tony Enzer that when we have him on here in just a little bit. But Major League Baseball, there's a guy right now who's on just some sort of insane fire, David. And that's Charlie Blackman of the Colorado Rockies. 17 games into the season, <laughs> he, li he literally had a 500 batting average. And, and this isn't like a three for six deal. Yeah. Uh, he going into today was 34 for 68. Uh, and, and, and today, uh, I, I caught the game a, a little bit. Uh, with them, and uh, he was over three today. So the bad average just dropped to like four seventy nine. But he walked. Let me tell you about the walk, David. This tells you what kind of respect he's getting right now. He's batting third in the lineup. Okay, Nolan Arenado, who on the day was two for three with two homers, and his third at bat just missed a homer, was oh. batting behind him. They intentionally walked Charlie Blackman to get to Nolan Arenado. That is the kind of respect that man is getting right now from opposing teams. And if he wants to hit 400 this year, let's say it's 200 at bats. 
because yeah. you're, I think that's that's a good estimate for a 60 game season. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the way, he's got to go 46 for 129, which is a 357 batting mm-hmm. average, still pretty impressive. But if he does that in 200 at bats with what he's done now, he will finish at 400. I want to know, can he do it? Is he going to bat 400 this year? You know, this is, I told you, some crazy things are going to happen in this season. I mean, the Marlins. Uh, look like they're the wor- potential, you know, world, ch- world champions here. They've been playing great baseball even after the whole COVID mess to start their season out. The Cubs have shocked me and play- the way they're playing. I didn't see them coming together that quickly and the pitching, you know, firming up the way it did. Uh, the Padres have surprised me. But for an individual, it has to be Blackman. Because last year we went in with a lot of hope with the Rockies. We thought, oh, the- and they fell flat. Everybody's bats died. The pitching went south. This year, they're serious. They're playing good baseball. A team that you can also say is kind of disappointing, maybe Cincinnati to a wee bit, the Reds. I thought they'd have a little bit more punch. The Angels, a little bit more punch. I don't know if he can carry 500 or 400. It's going to be tough. But if he can do it at 60 games, he probably can't get a lick at it. He'll get to see it. I will say one thing. Speaking of the Reds, I saw a stat on Joey Votto so far this season. You know, last year he struggled. This year, three strikeouts, 11 walks. How about that for a walk to strikeout ratio? I don't think anyone's done that since Bonds. Yeah. Uh, that that one uh, that one season where he uh, just you know got intentionally right. walked the entire time. Yeah. Uh, we got a uh, Cash Warren checking us out today from uh, Virginia. <laughs> And uh, he wants to know the Mariners look like they suck again and why. (laughs) Well, they weren't going to be competitive this year anyway. They're definitely rebuilding. I I thought last year they made some good moves in the offseason to try to build up the the minors and try to get some more talent in that system. And and they got some decent pieces there, uh, but but they're still a couple years away. I'm going to tell you, one one player I think – could be a future Hall of Famer or just an all-league player, is the Seager kid in Seattle. He can hit the ball. He can field. Uh, you know, his brother's down the road in Los Angeles. Uh, but I, I think he – I mean, he busted two out on the Rangers on Monday night. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that uh, he comes and rises to the cream with those young players. But Toronto didn't have – they didn't have uh, – Seattle didn't have a good farm system. They had been on that thing. We're going out to get Robbie Cano. And, and, and so – you got laden with those overpriced free agents and you kind of stripped your uh, farm system. Now I think they understand it. They've got to go young and develop these players. Uh, get, give the Mariners another season. Maybe next year we can talk serious about them. Yeah, and another thing, too, the uh, division they're in uh, right now, you got the Astros who are pretty good. They've been struggling. They blown, the Astros have blown eight saves already. They blew 20 last year. They've blown eight already in uh 2018 or uh, 2018 uh 2020 and then you got the a's who are looking really really good so yeah. uh even if the mariners do get on track they still got uh, yeah, totally. a couple of teams they gotta they gotta get past and then the angels are kind of on par with them right now i think uh but the angels got mike trout and you don't so there's another team that you got to worry about uh um, if it gets hot if he gets hot it changes the game and, and this season i i think what they're Houston's like eight and six or something like that. You get on a hot streak. They lost like six of their last five. If you get on a hot streak, you you uh, you sweep somebody. You can't give up a whole series to Texas like you did California. But you get hot, you can go work last to first, just like that. Well, uh, Cash also wants to know how the Saab Poodles were doing if they were playing any ball this year because they shut things down in Norfolk Tides in March. That's a great question to lead into our next guest. How about the uh, president and GM of the Amarillo Saab Poodles? And to answer your question, Cash, no, we did not have Saab Poodle baseball this year, but we did have baseball of some kind. And that's because this guy, along with a few others, uh, got some stuff together very last minute, and we had a, a Texas Collegiate League season. Tony Enzer, president and GM of the Amarillo Saab Poodles, thanks for joining us tonight on this live interactive Tom Talks Baseball podcast. How you doing? Good, guys. How are you guys doing? I, 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 love, the, I love the baseball graphics and everything else. You guys, uh, I, I love the look of your show, so uh, it's, <laughs> all, it's incredible. But it's great to see you again. Well, it's, 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 it's very good to see you, Tony. Uh, of course, you know, COVID affected the side poodle season. We didn't have that, 
but you were able to find a way to get Texas Collegiate League baseball in here. We got some Texas uh, or got some college athletes to play in a wooden bat league for 30 games. And we just wrapped that up over the weekend. Just just quickly as a whole, would you have did you consider that a big success here in Amarillo in 2020? Yeah, guys, you know, I really did. You know, I, I, we went into this thing for, for three reasons, really. One, the first one, and I may have told you about these. First one was kind of self-survival. I mean, you, you look at the situation we faced uh, going back to 2019, having a very, very successful beginning. Um, but if you went, if you fast forward and, and kind of saw that read the tea leaves uh, back in May, I just I just wasn't sure. There was been no announcement from uh, from Major League Baseball whether they're going to supply players to the minor leagues. But I, I just got a sense that we may not be fortunate enough to have uh, baseball this year because it's a very complex thing. It's one thing to take 25, 30 players, taxi squad, maybe 40 players uh, to 30 different markets around the country for Major League Baseball and open up the season with no fans. It's a whole nother thing to take 25 players over 160 markets in minor league baseball all traveling and everything else. And so just kind of read the tea leaves and said, you know, I, I just don't feel great about this. So I started doing some research, looking for some other uh, avenues to, to create events and to create baseball. Because if you looked at it, if, if, major, if minor league baseball was not going to happen, and this was my thought process at the time, then we go from September 16th of, of 2019 to April of 21 without generating any revenue. And uh, like I've said often is you don't have to be a Wharton School of Business graduate to understand that's not a very good business model. <laughs> I was fortunate to, to reach out. I originally reached out to the Cape Cod League and and really invited them, which is, as you guys know, your baseball guys, it's yeah. the oldest college wood bat league in the country, uh, over 100 years old, and asked them, hey, would you guys be interested in moving your your operation down to Texas? Because at the time, I, I think we all felt that Texas was going to be opening up uh, sooner and, and more aggressively than other states around the country. So we thought we had an opportunity, didn't know anything, but we just were hopeful. Um, but that, you know, they, they just didn't really have the, they had already shut down their season. It had only been a few days, but they just didn't kind of, their 501c3, 501c3 run. And I don't think they had the bandwidth to be able to take on that kind of operation to move it down to Texas. So once I, uh, once I failed on that term, then we, uh, a buddy of mine in San Antonio, we went to the Texas Collegiate League, which had four existing teams in, in uh, Acadiana. Uh, uh, you had Victoria, Texarkana, and Bravos Valley, which is in College Station. Those four existing teams, and we went to them and said, hey, we'd like to talk to you about expanding your league for the 2020 season. And uh, they were gracious enough to get into talks with us and conversations and ended up bringing ourselves, San Antonio, um, uh, Tulsa, Frisco, and Round Rock into the league. So that made it a nine-team league. And Round Rock kind of came in at the last under the wire. I think they came in on a Thursday or Friday before we are going to announce on a Monday, Tuesday. So we had to scramble a little bit. And I said, you can't really have a travel schedule with nine teams or a competitive balance schedule with nine teams. So I'll take two. Uh, <laughs> and that's how we ended up with both the Sod Squad and the Sod Dog teams. And, uh, you know, the, I, I got to tell you, so the three reasons why we got into it was A, self-revival we talked about. Uh, B was, you know, I'd been reached out to by so many members of our community saying, Tony, can you get Hodgetown open? Can you do things to get Hodgetown open to kind of spur, to light the spark of getting our community back open again? And, and uh, I felt very strongly that, you know, after going through uh, the, the COVID pandemic shutdown for a couple of months, that we really needed something. And our community needed something to something to smile about, something to 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 hang their hat on, to to be able to get out of their house, have a great time, take their families out, still create memories for 2020, and and not have 2020 be a wasted summer. And so uh, we thought it was important to get people out of the house and in this clean, beautiful, safe environment of Hodgetown and. And then finally, we did it for those those kids, those players, you know, the players that came from literally all over the country and in some places all over the world to come and be able to play baseball again and continue their dreams of, of, of developing their talents in hopes of uh, getting to sign a professional baseball contract at some point. Because as you guys know, there was a lot of great talent out there in the country 
because there were major league baseball holds the draft. There's 40 rounds around hundred players per round. And then, you know, they, they knocked it from 40 rounds down to only five rounds in order to save money during COVID, you know, cause everyone's stressed very thin in this. And so there were only five rounds of players who got drafted, meaning there were 35 rounds of players who didn't get drafted. And you got to see a lot of those players playing in the TCL this, uh, this last summer uh, here in Amarillo and across the Texas Collegiate League. And I got to tell you, from all those standpoints, it was such a blessing for us. You know, it, it's, while it's not, a, it's not a cure-all for COVID and the financial harm that it's done to minor league baseball teams and specifically our baseball team, uh, but it did, it, did, it did really help us to be able to keep our staff employed, to bring 150 uh, to 200 uh, part-time employees back to the ballpark, uh, and be able to pay them uh, and be able to help us to pay the bills that we had already accumulated because we were ready to go for 2020. If you remember, yeah. this thing shut down March 15th, 17th, in that time frame, we were ready to go. Yeah. So all the expenses had been paid for 2020, but now you didn't have revenue come in. So that was spelled disaster. So uh, from our from our own financial survival standpoint, to helping out the community and giving something for these kids to really hang their hat on, was was truly a blessing for us and and our and our community responded you know you're talking over the 32 dates what we draw 56,000 people uh out to the ballpark that's incredible between the two teams uh very special summer and it's a very Texas thing to do you know when you when you're given the hand that we were dealt you know get a new hand you know make your make something happen and uh, and that's what we're able to do and we're very 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 humbled by the community support and our partners that came on to support this thing this summer. It was fantastic for everything. Yeah. I think one thing this did was show that Amarillo likes baseball. Uh, so it, it wasn't saw poodles. It wasn't maybe at the same level as the saw poodles. It was still very entertaining. Uh, the games were really good. We had a team make the postseason, and the crowd showed up. And I was out there for a few games. David and I had a chance to go out one day uh, game together, and uh, the crowds were great. They were into it, just like it was the Saw Poodles. So it, I think this town's ready to bring uh, the Saw Poodles back in 2021. Okay. You, you had oh, I think so. Now I'm not saying they're Saw Poodle town because those guys are professionals on Saw Poodle. These kids played Division One. A lot of them, Kentucky, George Mason. Uh, all across across the country, you see, you respect baseball. Miami. Yeah. yeah, yeah, these guys yeah. are no jokes, and they played a good brand of baseball. The night we went out and met t uh, Tony up on the boardwalk, they had fallen down a couple of runs into the ninth, and they got a runner on. And Tony said, "Oh, it's time for some sod poodle magic." And before we get <laughs> and to sure the enough, <laughs> the gift store, the guy you know hesitated. First, second base and make the stupid play. He scores. They win by two. Yeah, so no, it, 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 it was amazing. Yeah, the magic. Is, there's something to be said. Hodge, there is magic, and I, I think I, uh, I said Hodgetown magic because there's something special about Hodgetown, yeah. and what makes Hodgetown yeah. magic happen is our community and the fans that come out to support him. And, and uh, Tom, you were talking about that. I, you know, I think our community. I, I really think, and I say this all honesty. I think. Amarillo has the best sports fans in the country, pound for pound. They're bigger markets, bigger stadiums. We all know that. But pound for pound, I don't think there's a better sports market in the country because our fans are both savvy sports fans, savvy baseball fans. They get it. They know what's going on. But they're also very – once they support you, they're passionate about it. And you, oh, yeah. you saw that passion, uh, and that's what you were talking about because they didn't know these kids at all. I mean, they didn't know them from the first day. But immediately once we try to, and that was part, that's our responsibility is to communicate the, you know, to talk about the kids. And that's why you saw Sam Levitt interviewing a kid every, before every single game. So that people got to know that, that kid uh, that was out here and, and how they traveled from San, Fr San Francisco or North Carolina or Florida or here in Texas, Oklahoma to come play for, for these two teams. And so I think that was important. Once the fans got to know them, it was Katie bar the door. I mean, they, yeah. they, they might as well have been their kids in their own homes. They were supporting them so much. <laughs> now we've seen with the major league baseball, they have had some issues this year with COVID-19. They've had to shut some teams down for a period of time. And because of that, you know, some teams are like six, seven games behind everyone else. Uh, you guys were able to finish the season. There was one little hiccup in there with, with the team that I think dropped out, but overall, 
how 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 did you guys handle COVID nineteen, and how were you able to finish the season with real relatively minimal issue from what it seemed like on the outside? Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I was so proud of our players, you know, uh, and and how serious they took this season, how serious they took the 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 uh, the, the issue of COVID. You know, we had an initial meeting at the start of the season, and I said, "Look, guys, you know this 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 league this season." you will all be successful. You're going to be playing for your, your teammates, for your families, for your girlfriends, for your coaches, playing for Amarillo. Uh, respect all those, playing for Hodgetown, playing for this organization. Uh, and this, this league will be successful as long as you make it successful. And that means, you know, you're here to play baseball for 30 days. So you don't go out and, and what normal young people would want to do, go hang out with each other and make friends in new places and that sort of thing. Uh, and they respected that. And so, they were literally ballparked the hotel to visiting uh, cities where they'd have to go, but they, they took it very seriously. We masked up wherever we went. We tested all the players before the season and then monitored their health daily uh, through temperature test and symptom, uh, symptom questionnaires, but also new players that came in, they all had to be tested. And we work with uh, Northwest Texas hospital and, and, uh, and they did a great job uh, in, in giving us the information we needed. We worked with our, our local health officials uh, to create the protocols both for the team and the facility. So I, I think we're, we, if you can say, uh, we're, I think we're a good example of, of how to handle something like this. And, and also, you know, we're very blessed. We got, you know, as, 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 as rapid as this thing can spread, we feel very fortunate, very blessed that our players took it seriously, our staff took it seriously, and our fans took it seriously. When you guys were out here, you saw everyone was masked up, uh, except for when uh, when they went to their seats. They were allowed, just like a restaurant, to take their mask off because you're all social distanced in the seats, and we set that up in the system to where you couldn't even buy a seat that wasn't social distanced. So uh, I think we followed the protocols, and we went above and beyond the protocols to really create a health and safe uh, a healthy and safe environment for both the fans, players, and our staff. And and we were so blessed that we, we didn't have any issues, and we're just thankful for that. Go ahead, David, if you got anything. Well, uh, we, we talked about that, about what else could the stadium be used for. Once we found out it didn't look like we were going to have a major league season, uh, let's own any ball, and you found these young men and brought them in here. Uh, were you worried about how they'd be accepted by the community? Did you think, oh, they're going to get out. Uh, they're not soft pools. Don't pay attention to these kids. But it seems like they got embraced by the community. Well, you know, I was, I'll be honest with you. I was very, very bullish on this thing from the very beginning. Cause I, I know our market, I know our sports market, I know our fans. And I knew that they wanted something. They needed something to get uh, out of the house and, and be passionate about it. We're, we're Amarillo is a very passionate city and they wanted something to get out and, and, and really support and to get out and, and scream and holler and, and have a reason to, to put a smile on their face. Uh, I think everyone around the country needed that, but uh, specifically here in Amarillo, I, I felt like it would be uh, supported and, uh, and, and, and we were very, uh, we were rewarded by that. We had a lot of our season ticket holders who bought the many packages, the many season tickets to come out and enjoy the games. Um, and then we had a, a lot of people that uh, did a walk up uh, ticket purchase because they weren't sure. Uh, I think early on there was a little question mark as to what is Collegiate Wood Bat League. No one had ever heard of it in this market before. Um, but what, I think once they got out and they saw what these kids were capable of, because I think you were talking about it, Dave, it was a very high level of baseball. If you watched any of our games, it was a very high level. Yeah. Once they got the yips out of them early on, I think that first game was probably the ugliest game I saw because most of these kids had never played in front of more than – a couple hundred, 300 people before they were playing in front of two, 2000 people. And so once they got that first game out and were, were not as nervous as, uh, as they and the kind of settled into a group, which baseball players do and athletes do, I think the fans started to see the talent, you know, guy, we had, we had a lot of guys on our team throwing the nineties. We faced guys uh, throwing the mid nineties to 98 miles an hour. Um, so you saw a level of talent that I think was really, really good. Again, most a lot of these guys would have been drafted this year or next year or the following year. Uh, so they're on the radar of all the, the pro scouts. And and so I think the level of talent was there. And I think our fans responded to that. And, and again, our fans, 
are, you know, I'd like to say they would support the three of us if they if we went out there and and tried to play baseball. But I, I think that's a stretch. I don't think um, so. Yeah. <laughs> looking at the athleticism on the three of us here, I don't know that uh, that would be the case. But they they really went out there and, and uh, supported these kids, and we couldn't be more proud of the kids and our fans for the way they responded. Well, it's like I tell people, I talk baseball, I don't play it. There, yeah, you know, yeah. There's, there's a reason why I talk it now. <laughs> exactly. It's not Tom plays baseball. It's, yes, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. and, I, and that word talk is, is much bigger than the other words <laughs> in that name. But, uh, of course, you know, like, you know, the community accepted the players very well. A lot of these guys had college seasons underway, maybe played 10, 15 games. Then uh, the, the shutdown happened and their seasons came to an end. And did any of these players come up to you individually or anyone that you know that just said how grateful they were to have a chance to play some sort of season in 2020? Yeah, I got to tell you, the, uh, the end of the season was pretty emotional. We, we, we got very attached to these young men, you know, because, again, we were with them virtually every day from June 30th to August 2nd. And, and guys, excuse me one second. I'm going to plug my laptop in. This is a technical glitch. Because oh, it just okay. my battery's running low and I don't want to drop the signal. So give me just one second. Talk amongst yourselves and I'll uh, charge this thing up. My apologies. Okay. Uh, well, this will be a good time to tell us, uh, talk, David, about what it is we're doing here. This is the uh, Tom Talks Baseball Podcast. We are doing a live interactive show uh, this evening. You can find us on three places. You can either be watching on our Facebook page, uh, Tom Talks Baseball Podcast. Every single one of them is going to go up there. Uh, we have a YouTube channel now, uh, Tom Talks Baseball Podcast. Every time we go live, it's also on YouTube. So maybe if you're not so much a Facebook person, you can do YouTube. You don't have to have an account, I don't think. You can just go find the video and, and watch it there. We're also on a 100.9 The Eagles YouTube page right now, KXGL. That's tough to say when you've talked all evening. KXGL-FM. So look for that. And once again, this is interactive. Yeah. Uh, if you're watching, if you went to Hodgetown at all this year, let us know about your experience uh, watching both the Sod Dogs and the Sod Squad play. Have any questions for Tony? Uh, shoot away because uh, you got a chance to, to speak with the man right here, right now on this interactive podcast. Uh, but I've got a you, question for you, Tony. Go uh, for it, David. You know, you look at the, the, in high school, some of those kids and college kids. Uh, the college kids, especially, if they missed their summer uh, season last year, they got an extra year of eligibility. You're playing professional baseball. It isn't about that. Do some of the guys feel like now they're really going to have to press it to get to the next level? Uh, you know, it, it's one year off their career. They didn't get to spend, and maybe some will push and really want to go to that next level. You'll see some some Herculean efforts out of these guys in the next season. Yeah, I, 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 that's a great question, David, and, and I'll, I'll I'll answer that one. Then Tom, I'll come back to your question before I had to leave for uh, to uh, to plug in. And by the way, I was disappointed that this was now a video uh, show because I really have a, a face for radio. But um, <laughs> hey, but, hey, right here, right here. <laughs> um, so yeah, David, that's a, that's a great question because these kids again, they. Not so much that they had to. It's great that they did, that NCAA gave them all uh, an extra year of eligibility. But you think about the number of players who didn't get drafted this year. That pool now that's, that's trying to get to, to professional baseball just got a lot smaller. Yeah. Um, and and my understanding is, and I don't know this for certain. I don't know that Major League Baseball knows this for certain. But what I've heard that next year it may go back to twenty rounds. So that's still half the number of rounds that would yeah. be normally. Uh, drafted into uh, professional baseball could be cut in half. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> could be cut in half again next year. So uh, I think that's problematic for these young players. That that pool of players that makes it to professional baseball gets a little bit smaller. <clears throat> and so I hope that answers your question, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tom, to, to answer your question about the players. Oh, 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 I'll tell you what, real quick, Tony, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a break there if you want to, want to catch your breath there. Uh, yeah, I want to get some water. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, one, one of your MCs, uh, Dennis Humphrey, checking us out tonight, kind of answered that mm -hmm. question a little bit. A lot of people, uh, play, parents and players, <laughs> Stan Amarillo and the Saw Poodles on the Side Squad Facebook page over the past week. Really cool to hear from them. So it sounds like, indeed, uh, not, not just the players, but also the parents 
uh, thankful that the, their kids got a chance to play here in 2020. And Dennis is awesome, by the way. He does a heck of a job uh, on the field with those in between uh, inning events. So, Dennis, thanks for watching tonight, man. Yeah, no, Dennis is exactly right. You know, the, the players, what I, what I start, start, started to say earlier was it was very emotional at the end of the season because you'd gotten very close to these players. You were with them for literally 33 days straight. Um, you know, at no time did we really not have a player in the in the house. Um, so I was fortunate enough to, to be down there when the, the sod squad and, and their last playoff game. And it was a very emotional goodbye after that game. And every single one of those players, not one, two, three, but every single one of them came up and, and thanked us for the experience that we gave them uh, here in uh, in Amarillo and how the fans treated them. And we treated them like professional ball players, not in the fact of what they received, but how we treated them with respect. You know, the accommodations that we we put them on the road with the with the sod puddle bus. We got them new uniforms. They played in this beautiful facility. Um, we, we really tried to treat them with the respect, same respect that we treat professional baseball players. Uh, and they felt that, and they felt that this wasn't just an event for us. They, they were our team and they became a lot of them. I'll tell you a, a funny uh, story about Terrell Hudson. I mean, he, this is a kid who two way player from New Mexico, great kid uh, on the uh, sod dogs. And uh, I was talking to him at the end of the season and he goes, Tony, I just want to say thank you for everything that you did and, and the way you guys treated us. And and I said, you know what, Terrell, you 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 did such a great job for us. You held yourself high. The level of, of uh, the way you carried yourself and the way your teammates carried themselves, you know, we couldn't be more happy than you'll always be a part of the Sod Poodle family. And he goes, uh, and this I thought was super cute. That who knows, Tony? Maybe the next time you see me, and I, I told him we're going to follow your career and see how you're doing, and just like the other players. And he said. Who knows, Tony, maybe the next time you see me, I'll be a official sod poodle player. And I just thought that's how cool is that? That that's what he wants to strive to be. And and that was the same thing with the sod dogs. They were so happy. This for a lot of these guys, you gotta think about the relationships they made, the bonds that they made, because this both teams were very tight knit all season long. Mm -hmm. Um and the bonds they made with us and our staff and how we promoted them, because we told them right off the bat, look. We're going to try through our social media channels, which, you know, Tess Bloom, our, our, our director of marketing, manages very well. We get the message out very well to our fans and get these players known. And they had a blast, you know, from the promotions on the field to how we promoted them through the games and social media and TCL TV. Uh, they were just very, very happy with that. And the parents were very happy. They, The parents got to see their kids playing in a safe and, and healthy environment and and know that their kids were taken care of. They loaned up their kids for a summer, and we took very good care of them, and I think they're all very appreciative of it. Well, I think we here in Amarillo, Tony, appreciate it too, the fact that we got to see some baseball at Hodgetown this year. And even though it wasn't full, you know, 6,500, 7,000 uh, capacity crowds there, we still got the, the side pool experience because you guys did everything uh, – on top of the games, everything that you would have done had it been the saw poodles. But now that the season's over, uh, what's next for Hodgetown here in 2020? Uh, we, we talked with Suzanne Talley uh, just a little bit ago. We got the Boots versus Badges charity softball game happening on Saturday. But at, beyond that, uh, any other plans for Hodgetown this year that uh, the residents of Amarillo can take advantage of? Yeah, you know, and I'll go back to one thing you just said there, because I think that was uh, kind of the – I did another interview the other day, and they asked, you know, why were – why was this so successful for you? Because I think you probably saw we, we were we accounted for a little over uh, half of the attendance in the TCL and, and, and other teams, the older teams didn't report. So it's probably around 40 percent of the Texas Collegiate League uh, uh, attendance. And I said it a because we have the best sports market in, ten, in in the country, but also because we, from the word go, we talked as a staff, you know, and that's, that was very important uh, from our staff standpoint that we, we don't want to, 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 uh, I don't know the word is to lessen the baseball experience, no matter what we're doing. We want all of our events, whether it's a concert, a baseball game, a graduation, uh, a uh, opening up bar 352 or any event that we do movie night to be less of an experience than we create with the hospital. So we went into this, full bore saying we're going to give our fans the best possible experience we can in this COVID year. And I think fans saw that we had fireworks shows. We had our 
Thirsty Thursdays, our Wiener Wednesdays giveaway nights. So we kept that ball, the promotional ball rolling and tried to create that special experience for people. So I think that really helped us uh, uh, in this TCL season as well. And people responded to that. But uh, it's ironic you ask about uh, what else we're doing. We, we actually have a, a special events committee meeting tomorrow. We've got some events planned right now. The ones you, you, you've talked about, Boots and Badgers, we're working on two other events that haven't been announced yet, so we can't really share those with you. But they're going to be larger scale events, uh, very similar to uh, what you saw in the TCL, not baseball, but other events. Okay. And then uh, a brainstorming session, because I think we're, you're going to still see some uh, other events in at the end of August and September uh, before we get into the colder months starting in October. So we, we've got a lot planned coming up. Uh, and, you know, Hodgetown, the, the club level is available 365 for, for fans that want to do corporate events or church events or small group events, obviously with social distancing and, and COVID protocols in mind. Uh, every event we do has that uh, in place now. But uh, we're not we're not resting. Well, OK, we did rest a little bit after the TPL season. Uh, just just a little bit. Right. <laughs> yeah, <that's the> <laughs> yeah. You know, kind of getting uh, getting your your the gray matter working again because uh i mean my staff and i gotta hand it to them i mean you guys saw the work that they put in yeah, yeah. from our full-time staff to the part-time staff and most of our full-time folks were here 13 14 hours a day for 32 days straight 30 days straight and then a couple of days in between there but that's that's they they virtually killed themselves to make this a very special season for our community and our players and and I, I couldn't be more proud of the staff and because you got to think guys what we did here in Amarillo as a collective group our season ticket holders our fans our our corporate partners uh, our community and our city and this staff did there was nothing like this in the country there was no higher level of baseball with more fans attending. The, here, uh, than anywhere else in the country. And that was done right here in Amarillo, uh, Texas. And I'm so proud of this community and what we're able to do. And we're going to continue that that uh, that same experience building and those more events as we move forward into the, the fall. Well, well, speaking of events, Tony, uh, so th there's a minor league uh, stadium right now that's housing a major league baseball team and, and i'm going to uh real quickly i'm going to put this up here because uh on twitter uh the uh, t at blue jays the toronto blue jays twitter did this really incredible uh the yeah, salem field in buffalo new york did this really incredible makeover and, and it's like a four minute video you can find them uh look at the blue jays on twitter this is amazing the way they transformed this stadium into you know, the home for the Blue Jays here in 2020 at Major League Park. Now, obviously, we're not going to do that here in Amarillo. I get that. But looking for events to maybe uh, house in the future, do you think we can get maybe a Major League game in town, whether it be a regular season or an exhibition spring training type game? Do you, do you, is that something that you've done before at other places, or is it something that you've thought about down the road at Hodgetown? Yeah, I've, I've probably done two or three major league games, ex, whether it be exhibition games or a couple uh, different major league clubs playing in, in my facilities in the past. And it's something that we want to do in the future. It's something we talked about when we first got here. That was one of our kind of my long range plans is to to get uh, to get a major league clubs to come in here to for an exhibition game as they're leaving spring training. Uh, those are all things we're going to be working on in the future and, and continue to to try to drive the drive that excitement and that energy here in Amarillo because I would love to, I think our, our committee would love to see uh, Major League Baseball players uh, here uh, playing against each other or playing against our Sod Poodle uh, team yeah. in the future in an exhibition game. But, uh, you know, the one thing that we have going for us here in Amarillo that was so special last year during uh, 2019, our inaugural season, was we had, uh, and, and this is, you know, for the, for the baseball fans out there, we sent 11 guys from Amarillo to the major leagues last year, um, straight from Amarillo, Texas, to the majors, bypassing AAA. And, and that was very cool for our fans to be able to see. We had a couple – we uh, had rehab guys coming down from the major leagues. Everyone rem remembers Fernando Tatis and yeah. that amazing uh, uh, couple of games he spent here. So you'll continue to see major league rehabs down here. You'll, con you'll continue to see our sod fiddle players – graduate to that next couple levels 
going to AAA and to the major leagues. And I think you're going to see a big influence of uh, Major League Baseball here in Amarillo for many, many years to come. But I'll tell you a little secret. Okay. Because the uh, the Toronto Blue Jays situation, there was a time where New York was not going to allow that to happen in Buffalo. Um, so we did a little reaching out to see if there was some potential. Oh. <laughs> um to have the Blue Jays here uh, in uh, in Amarillo, but uh, you know we just we we wanted to ask that question. We knew it was very far fetched that, that that could happen, but uh, we we did chase that down a little bit, and unfortunately it didn't happen for us. But uh, we we knew about that, and we're actively trying to make something happen here in Amarillo. So you you know I'll be honest with you, and you guys know me, you guys know my staff. There's really not uh, a whole lot that we're not going to try to. Uh, create an experience here in Amarillo, whether it's Major League right. Baseball, whether it's moving ice, and those are things that we're planning out here for this fall uh, for fans to come out and get to experience the hot town in a, a different way through concerts and everything else. We're going full bore into that, not just, you know, for 2020, but that's our future. You know, the, the more events, the bigger events we can do out here, the better. And we know Amarillo wants that, and so we're going to try and bring it here. Well, well, Tony, uh, one final question, then we'll, then we'll get you out of here. I'm, pr- I'm sure it's approaching dinner time, and it looks like you're still at the office. Or or is that your man cave? What is that yeah, behind this, it? This is my office. Okay, uh, all right. <laughs> which, you know, it's part man cave, part office, part home. So gotcha. I spend probably as much time here as I do at home. Yeah. Um, but no, this is my office. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll get one final question here. Of course, uh, I mean, COVID-19 has had a big impact on stuff this year. And there was and there was one thing happening in 2019 before all this happened, and that was talks of contraction uh, with minor league baseball taking about 42 teams away. Now, that's not going to affect Amarillo from the sound of it because, you know, you got the nice state-of-the-art stadium, brand-new team nice amenities and everything. So we're fine. But the the landscape of minor league baseball has strong potential to look different next year. And I guess there was a new committee that was put together by the president of the MILB, I believe, that uh, uh, DJ Elmore Jr., I think, is on this committee to try to negotiate with the MLB. How, and I know you're not a big part of that committee, possibly, but how different could minor league baseball look in 2021 and how could that affect what we have here in Amarillo? Well, let me, let me first start with uh, DG Elmore and, and him being on the negotiating committee with major league baseball. How cool is that for Amarillo that out of 160 teams in the country that our owner uh, is on that negotiating committee. What's that say about our organization, about our ownership group? I just think I congratulated DG because there's nobody uh, that in the country that I, I could see doing a better job representing uh, minor league baseball than DG Elmore because Dave Elmore and the Elmore Sports Group has such a such a, re- a great reputation throughout minor league baseball, major league baseball, that when when they talk and when they say things, uh, they mean it. They're very authentic people, great negotiators, great uh, to work and, and create partnerships. And that's what this is. Minor League Baseball, Major League Baseball, that's a partnership. And and I, I think uh, there's things on both sides that, that, that uh, the Major League Clubs want and the things that the Minor League Clubs want. And I think they'll be able to pull that together. Yeah, I think it could look a little bit different in 2021 and moving forward. But I, I'm not at all concerned with that relationship between the major leagues and minor leagues. It's it's a very uh, it's a great marriage. They need us, we need them, and I think those things are going to be worked out. They'll again at a higher level than me. Uh, if they ask me, I'll certainly give them my input. But I don't know that they are going to ask me. But uh, I couldn't think of anyone better than DG Elmore to to take the needs of minor league baseball. Because if you think about it, who better to represent uh, minor league baseball baseball? Then an owner that has a two short season clubs uh, has as uh, multi, as multiple as 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 a low A club, a high A club, a double A club, and a triple A club. We literally cover all the different levels, so he has experience in all those levels to be able to talk from not just you know what being able to imagine what that's like at each level, but having a, a working knowledge of what that's like at each level. So uh, I think minor league baseball, I think this will secure whatever agreement comes out will be a long-term agreement. So minor league baseball will be fine. It may look a little bit different, uh, but I think it's going to be, you won't see the difference here in Amarillo. You won't see it in most places. I think you're really going to see more of a difference at the lower levels, double A, triple A, 
uh, I think you're going to be seeing very much of the same and, and maybe even grow and get better. Well, Tony, appreciate you joining us tonight, man. Uh, one final thing a little bit earlier, speaking of Fernando Tatis Jr., uh, Aturo checking us out. Tatis is looking amazing so far, and uh, yeah, no yeah. kidding, he is. And, and, and I think it's 100% due to the fact that he played a game and a half in Amarillo. I well, think that's exactly I mean, what it was. There's, that, there's, no, there's no discounting that time he spent in Amarillo helped him in his career. Uh, I think we all, and, and Fernando, he, he would uh, he would agree with that as well. He had a great time when he was here, loved the facility, loved the fans. You know, I had someone remark when they saw him last year, it, you know, it, it really showed them the difference in minor league professional players and a major league professional player, not in the skill level, because we have guys that are uh, as equally as skilled. They just don't have the experience. But the way he carried himself, the way he looked on the field, just his body, the way he moved, how quick he was, um, He's a very special player. We have a lot of special players. You see uh, uh, Edward Olivares up there in the major leagues now doing some amazing things for the yeah. Padres. Got his first home run the other day. Very proud to see that. And uh, But, you know, you'll continue to see that. You'll Because you have to remember, Fernando Tatis a couple of years ago played double-A baseball in, in San Antonio. And so, you know, he's a couple of years, a couple of three years removed from that level. And the, the difference in that you see – and like I say, just the way he carried himself, the way he moved, he, he's not just a special major league, uh, special player. He's going to be an all-star, perennial all-star at the major league level. And, and and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Very special guy, great guy, not only great player, but I got to spend a little bit of time with him. He's up on my wall of fame now. Uh, <laughs> in my office. And uh, he's just a great, great young man. Uh, personally, as well as a great professional baseball player. Well, no doubt if the Padres can find a way to eventually win a World Series here in the next uh, few years, uh, probably some players on that roster are going to have uh, gone through Amarillo at some point and, and honed in on their craft. And uh, we're glad to have the Saw Poodles here. We were glad to have TCL, Texas Collegiate League Baseball here, and we are also glad to have Tony Enzer here as well, president and GM of the Amarillo Saw Poodles. Uh, thanks for joining us on the Interactive Podcast tonight, Tony. Uh, come back anytime whenever you have a big announcement and want to surprise us with it. Absolutely. Is this your inaugural show? Well, we've, we've, do, we've done a few of these. We've been trying to do these uh, like Wednesdays around 5 p.m. Okay. Just, uh, you know, because David gets up really early. He does a Newsday Amarillo on KGNC AM. So we kind of come on here and talk Major League Baseball, local stuff, if anything like that's going on. Try to get guests like yourself on here. And then we invite people to, to chat if they have anything they want to say. They're welcome to be a part of the show. Well, you guys are great ambassadors for baseball and sports in this town. We couldn't we couldn't do what we do without you. We, we appreciate how you share the message of what we're trying to do, the great athletes that we have here. And, and I know you have a great listening audience as well. So thank you for everything that you do for – supporting professional sports and just sports in general in Amarillo because, you know, sports is that one thing that pulls us all together. You know, it, 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 even when we're here in Amarillo in this TCL, you could see it. Our whole community pulled together to support these young men who put their lives on hold to come play the game they love. And, and you could just see how sports pulls people together. Yes, it's going to pull you together and then put you against the opponent, but that's yeah. okay. That's what sports is. You know, it's, yeah. You, you, I just love the, the way sports, it does that. It just pulls people together from all walks, from all backgrounds, whether you're a big fan or not. You come out here to Hodgetown, you feel the magic that David was talking about. And uh, and I, I just love that about sports. It's needed. It gives us that outlet. And sports is so important, not only here in Amarillo, but across the nation. And thank you guys for supporting it and what you do. I, th thank you for the kind words, Tony. And uh, and we look forward to having Saw Poodle Baseball back in 2021. We'll be here. So, Tony Enzer, President Jim of the Amarillo Saab Poodles. Take care. We'll talk to you later, man. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Have a good evening. <laughs> All right, Tony Enzer, uh, President Jim of the Amarillo Saab Poodles. Some kind words. I appreciate what he said yeah. there. And uh, and David, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I know it's approaching your bedtime because think you get up this. so stinking early. Think about this. He, got, he started gearing up after the championship season probably late October, start trying to plan and plot what the new season is going to look like. You know, they ran it to the wire and they figured out now they're going to let us play. And now he's got to switch that mode back on here in about another two months and be baseball, baseball, baseball. Yep. 
so hats off to those guys. A first class organization. Matt, Shane, uh, Sam, uh, Welly, everybody. Everybody from the person who parks your car to the president is a class individual and they treat you as such. Just a friendly, nice place to go see a ball game. We yes. appreciate it. Yeah, and it was great that we had a chance to at least get out there for one month this year and, and yeah. partake in, in some yeah. baseball. So and it still looked magnificent. Yes, it did. It, it, it looked it still beautiful. I mean, they, they put on the, the Sod Poodle show. It, it wasn't the Sod Poodle team, but it was the Sod Poodle show that was uh, that they put on for you. So you still got that full experience, and, and, it, and it made it worth going uh, to all the games that we were able to go to. And I know we had people that follow the podcast that went to quite a bit of games, and they enjoyed it, and we're happy to get some sort of baseball this year. One more thing before we get out of here, David. Uh, did you know that we were nominated for an award? I, I I still can't believe that happened, but thank you for whoever nominated us. I always said I was the best Scarlet uh, in Gone with the Wind, and I think they finally recognized my acting talent. I, I think that's what it is. I, I, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, I don't give it up. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the Best of Amarillo 2020 uh, Awards, uh, we were nominated under Best Podcast of one of four nominated Ooh, there. Fine. So um, you, you've probably, if you're on Facebook and you've liked a lot of businesses, you've seen a lot of the Best of Amarillo links. I know I have because a lot of those businesses have been uh, wanting to get your votes as well. Uh, and same with us. If you enjoy what we do, if you followed along with us the last couple of years, seen us grow this year was kind of a no kind of a wrench was thrown in everything with yeah. COVID-19. Yeah. But uh, we've we've kind of adapted and tried some new things like this here at the Interactive Podcast. Um, if you like everything we do and, and want us to keep going, Nominate us. Uh, go to that Best of Amarillo 2020. Find oh. the media podcast section. Uh, yeah. Give us a nom- Give us a vote, and uh, we'll see what happens. I think you have until the 24th of August to vote. Yeah. You can vote daily too. But yeah, thank yeah. you guys for uh, whoever yeah. you are that nominated us and made us one of the four podcasts on that list. I want. I want to give a shout out to Jay Cash. Hey Jay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. What's up, Jay? <laughs> Hope everything is cool and uh, Lolo and everybody's doing well. Then I want to give a special shout out to my man Danny Brill up in the Portland area. Uh, Danny, Danny's a trooper. I mean, dude, this guy will fight you to the end. He's had some heart issues. He had an eye issue, and now COVID. Yeah, so stay strong, Danny. If you need something, you holler. Yeah, keep fighting, Danny. Uh, g- good to hear from you tonight. Also, uh, Lucy, like you said, uh, Cash Warren, Aturo, uh, Chance, Dennis, all checking us out. And, and we and we love you guys always being here and chiming in and being a part of the show. But I think it's time for dinner, and it's time to watch some baseball, David. So, so I was watching the Tigers and Sox. Are, are, there, yeah, as was I. Uh, yeah. The Sox coming out with the wind. The Tigers kind of cooling off a bit. But that might be another show. Let's not get into another topic. <laughs> but uh, but well, thank you. you. Know, but yeah. <laughs> the White Sox were running my team. Right? That, that, that's true. That's true. But, hey, everyone, thanks for watching tonight. This has been the Tom Talks Baseball Podcast, Interactive Edition, Show 105. If you missed early parts of it you want to catch them back, you can find this on YouTube, Tom Talks Baseball Podcast, also KXGL-FM for the Eagle page, and as well on our Facebook, Tom Talks Baseball Podcast. David Lovejoy, thank you very much. Go to bed. Thank you for having me. Hey, had fun. Can't wait till next week as we get closer and closer to those playoffs, what they're going to look like, who's going to be in, who's going to be out. There's been some great pitching performances, too, we need to talk about. So Yeah, the, 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 there's, there's a lot of MLB. Maybe we'll do a little more MLB focus next week because we did we'll a lot that. of – We're, we're well, going we'll to hit the bigs real hard next week. Yeah, a, a lot of local thanks to Suzanne Talley with the yeah. Coffee Memorial and also Tony Enzer with the Saw Poodles for coming on live tonight and chatting with us about all they got going on. I'm going to buy four tickets. I'm telling you now, I'm going to buy four of those tickets for the event, for the boots and badges. All you have to do – is guess Tom's middle name? No, that's too easy. Uh, <laughs> what can we do to give away? What, what, what we well, 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 tell you what. If you do that, let me know, and we'll figure something out. And okay. then, if it, if it happens, we'll throw it up tomorrow on our okay. on our Facebook and our Twitter, and, and we'll give you guys a, a way to win those. And then we'll figure out how to get them to you. So, da- David, you figure that out before we go any further. And then, once you do, find me, and then we'll make it happen. We'll do it. All right, cool. So. Everybody have a wonderful night. Thanks for watching the Tom Talks Baseball Podcast. We will talk to you next week.